Good morning, one and all present here. I welcome you all to the 52nd webinar of a Saturday webinar series by Manage CIA. I am Zenith Content Developer at Manage CIA. Center for Innovation and Agripreneurship is a center of excellence hosted at the National Institute of Agriculture Extension Management. It's one of the leading agribusiness incubators in the country. And Manage CIA has mentored and incubated around 300 startups from various focus areas of agriculture and light sector. The topic for today's session is Agri Startup for Automation in Farming. We have three speakers joining us today. Our first speaker for the day is Mr. Benjamin Raja. Mr. Benjamin Raja is the founder and CEO at Farm Again. Farm Again is a startup operating in the domain of precision agriculture, and they offer the most advanced irrigation, fertigation, and climate management solution by effectively leveraging IoT and artificial intelligence. I request Mr. Benjamin Raja to start the session. Hey, uh, thanks. So, uh, can I get permission to share my screen? Yes, we'll make you the presenter. Sir, already given, sir. Oh, uh, but the share button is disabled. Uh, Come now, sir. Please share. Yes, sir. Pardon me? Or else we can share it from our end, sir, because sir? we already given. Uh, I'll remove, I'll do it, redo it, sir, once again. Okay, okay. Now, sir. Uh, it is still disabled. It says uh, uh, exit and join again. Shall we do that? It will take 30, 30 seconds. No, sir. We'll share it from our end, sir. Okay, that's fine. You know, you can just start, sir. And just share it. Okay. Meanwhile, uh, we're happy to introduce that uh, uh, Mr. Ben. Our program through uh, TNAU Agribusiness Incubator, uh, where manages knowledge partners. So we are happy to be here today. Thank you, sir. Yes, please, sir, you can take over. Okay. So, yeah, now I can see the screen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Am, am I audible? Yes, sir. You're audible, sir. Just let us know when we need to you know, change the slides. Oh, sure. Okay. So, uh, uh, good morning, everybody. I'm really glad to be uh, part of this forum. Um, so, I'm here to share my experience um, in the uh, automation uh, with artificial intelligence in the uh, precision agriculture uh, sector. Uh, and also discuss a little bit about uh, uh, the business models, uh, how and why it makes sense uh, for, uh, for us in this era uh, to adopt something like this, uh, uh, you know, uh, embrace artificial intelligence in agriculture. So those are some of the things that I will uh, talk about. So um, the, the name of uh, Farm Again itself was given uh, with, the, with the understanding that you look at farming from a different perspective, which is why we named it as Farm Again. Now, uh, the concept is about uh, uh, smart farming uh, using the latest technologies such as IoT and artificial intelligence. So, name of the platform is Grotron. Uh, essentially, it is an autonomous precision farming uh, platform. Next slide, please. So, what can we call as smart? So, essentially, there has to be something, uh, uh, you know, which is data driven, and the, the and the method of collecting data has to be systematic, and there needs to be some predictability in what we do with the data we collect. And there should be some uh, possibilities for analysis. And if you do that, technically, you should be able to make some corrective actions. And if you do that, you get into a kind of a continuous improvement cycle. And if you're able to do this in farming, that is what we call as smart farming. Next slide, please. Now, for those of you who may not, uh, who may have a myth about Internet of Things, to make things very simple, anything, it may be your car, maybe your cell phone, maybe your refrigerator, air conditioner, or anything, anything, uh, even your uh, spectacles or your shoes, if they're able to talk uh, with cloud or with internet, and if you're able to, for example, uh, 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 a tire uh, of a car has worn out. Now, if I'm able to get that information from the car through the cloud onto my uh, cell phone, then that tire becomes a thing in the internet, so which is what is referred to as Internet of Things. This is just for those of you who may not uh, clearly understand what that is. Next slide, please. 
So Grotron is essentially uh, a precision farming platform, which is smart by itself. And it uh, uh, uses technologies such as uh, Internet of Things and artificial intelligence. And for those, those of you uh, who may, again, um, uh, have some questions about artificial intelligence, it is uh, like a newborn baby. A newborn baby uh, is born with a brain, uh, not necessarily with any information in it, but as it grows, as it starts to observe things uh, in and around, what is happening in the neighborhood, uh, the child's brain starts to develop itself on its own. And at some point, it, it has a lot of information in it. It knows cause and effect. What needs to, what, what can be done effectively in a certain situation are things that the child's brain starts to learn on its own. And by doing so, at some point, the brain will be able to react to a situation that has never seen before. So that is the beauty of artificial intelligence and, and what happens in the human brain is what is getting depicted in, in, in the technology world. Next slide, please. So um, uh, in agriculture, the most important step uh, or the process is photosynthesis. We all might have studied this in uh, fourth and fifth grade. Um, so uh, chlorophyll is the only medium, a natural medium that can convert sun's energy into another form of energy or uh, sugar um, is a term that we typically use for uh, energy. So what happens during this time uh, is the plant, uh, while it takes the energy from sunlight, it also intakes carbon dioxide and it, it uh, makes use of its root system to absorb different types of minerals uh, from the soil. And then using, using the minerals available in the soil, and using the sun, uh, sunlight and the carbon dioxide that it gets from the atmosphere, it converts uh, into energy. So the, uh, the energy can be leaf growth, stem, flower, fruit, whatever it might be. And for this process to happen, and, and it, it also emits oxygen in the process after consuming uh, carbon from CO2. And in that process, uh, what is very important is that uh, the minerals, even if it is available in the root zone, uh, it, the plant's ability to uh, take the minerals is, is uh, limited by the right air water balance of the soil, which means if the soil ha uh, is in its right air water balance scenario, which means uh, the water and the air uh, are in the right composition, uh, is when the plant will be able to consume all the minerals and take part in photosynthesis uh, very effectively. So two, two key takeaways from this slide. One, um, the air water balance of the soil has to be maintained, which means it should not be dry. Uh, neither should it be uh, extremely wet or saturated, number one. Number two, the right minerals as listed on the right side. So the table that is on the right side is in fact, uh, uh, was borrowed from uh, Wageningen University's website. Uh, these are the mineral composition that a plant expects on the soil. So if these two conditions are met, then the plant will participate in photosynthesis very, very effectively, which means uh, when, when the photosynthesis is very effective, the growth of the plant, the flowering, fruiting, uh, all of that will be as optimal as one would expect. Next slide, please. Now, with that, uh, let us talk about a couple of scenarios. Before I, I get into the details of the technicalities, let's talk, of, talk about a couple of scenarios. So I'm sharing some of my own experience. So we started this precision farming journey in uh, 2012. And uh, uh, we did that initially with the help of some experts from Israel and uh, also um, some uh, experts back here in India. So we started, uh, started this effort uh, uh, down south in Thirunel Valley. And uh, uh, when we did everything picture perfect, so the, 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 the core team of Farm Again uh, did not have a background in agriculture. So we all came from um, uh, industries, like for example, I came from uh, aerospace and uh, industrial automation uh, industry. Um, and I was in research uh, in, in both of these industries. And uh, uh, the other co-founders also came from similar background. So we did not know what agriculture really was uh, all about. However, we have seen it in other countries and we saw a huge difference between uh, how we do versus 
uh, how the Israelis or Netherlands or uh, Spanish and Italians do, and which was an inspiration for us to try here in India. So we did try with the help of uh, uh, great experts. And what we found was we were able to get the results uh, as predictable as in any other industry. So if we targeted uh, X ton of harvest with the little, little bit of variation here and there, we were able to accomplish that. And uh, in 2014, uh, we went around to different parts of Tamil Nadu and also some, uh, some uh, areas in Maharashtra. And we were trying to uh, introduce the modern precision agriculture without using any technology uh, to the farmers locally. So an example from a village uh, near Coimbatore, which is where we are headquartered. We went to farmers and we were, uh, they, were, they were traditional farmers and that place was uh, uh, primarily growing vegetables. So we picked the most common vegetables and we found them to be in the order of tomatoes, brinjal, uh, ladies fingers and uh, chili. So what we did was, we, uh, tomato was the largest grown crop, therefore we picked tomato. Um, so we were interviewing farmers, nearly about 60 farmers we interviewed. And uh, they were all completely traditional farmers and uh, uh, their yield records were anywhere between three tons and seven tons an acre in one uh, crop cycle. So um, when we, we did uh, the first trial in our farm, uh, the quantum that we were able to get was somewhere around 80 plus tons in one acre. Uh, so uh, in an attempt to spread what we had learned, uh, we were basically trying to um, you know, ask for volunteers from the group. And we were giving them examples uh, because uh, I, we have seen in Nasik uh, farmers generally uh, 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 getting more than 40 tons. And we have seen in Kualar uh, farmers get more than uh, 20, 25 tons. Uh, not all the farmers, but uh, some good farmers. And the, the best example that I, had, uh, that I had seen was in a place called, uh, called Lossal Gaon uh, in uh, Maharashtra, India. A farmer in a uh, poly house, uh, he was able to get about 120 tons of tomato in an acre. And in the open farm, uh, he claimed that he uh, got about uh, 95 tons. So these are the records that we were talking with these uh, farmers and trying to tell them that uh, you can also try to have goals like this. And to our surprise, not many farmers volunteered. We had only two of them. And with both of them, uh, we did a trial. And what we really found was the uh, 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 one of the farmers was able to record a harvest of 84 tons as against his uh, standard harvest of anywhere between three and seven tons. So this was something we were able to accomplish without any technical uh, technological intervention. However, what happened subsequently was um, in the next cycles, uh, the level of uh, process adherence that you did uh, uh, on the first instance, started dipping down. Uh, eventually, it went back to the uh, same old story. Even in my farm, uh, we then uh, went back to less than 10 tons of harvest. So, which is where we felt the need for a techn technological intervention. And uh, since I come from a very strong um, background, technical background, uh, which is, uh, again, predominantly centered around sensors, you can imagine an aircraft uh, flying with uh, you know hundreds and thousands of sensors uh, actually flying the aircraft, and if a sensor has to malfunction, you can imagine what can happen. So I come from that industry. So therefore, what uh, 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 we took a call that uh, we will uh, you know try to build an intelligent system, which uh, uh, unlike an uh, the automation system that existed then in 2014, uh, where you can set some timing. Say for example, I have. Uh, uh, 10 valves in my farm, so I can say valve 1 irrigate for 30 minutes, valve 2 irrigate for 30 minutes, valve 3 irrigate for 1 hour, so on and so forth. That was not what we wanted because uh, um, by doing so, uh, we are not going to be able to maintain the air water balance of the soil, uh, which is when we felt the need for, uh, for, an, uh, for innovation, where we develop a system which can maintain the air water balance of the soil and uh, uh, the supplement uh, everything else around it, say for example, the nutrition supplements uh, and uh, things like that. So which is how Grotron as a concept, as a platform was given birth to. 
in 2014. So since 2014 uh, till about 2018, uh, we have uh, uh, done uh, enough and more uh, research in this area. We did uh, prototypes in, uh, in, in almost the whole of Tamil Nadu, in Maharashtra, parts of Karnataka, uh, and even in Telangana. Uh, before we called a product uh, commercially worthy and marketable uh, product. So, um, uh, with that, uh, getting, getting into the technical details of this uh, uh, platform, uh, so we call it as an autonomous form platform. So, if you can look at these uh, colored rectangles at the bottom of the screen, uh, bottom left of the screen, imagine each of those rectangles representing a valve or a plot in a form, uh, which is controlled individually by a valve. Now, uh, what we do is uh, into each of these plots, uh, as per the, uh, uh, we study the plot and try to figure out uh, uh, is one sensor good enough, two, five, we make a study and then based on what we feel fit, um, we implant sensors. The basic sensors would be uh, the, the ones that will measure the soil pressure, what is commonly known as the tensiometers and uh, then uh, we also uh, implant a temperature sensor and then you also need to be able to know the uh, evaporation laws therefore we have uh, ambient temperature and uh, uh, relative humidity sensors so these are the four basic sensors uh, that we keep at each uh, plot or a valve area and uh, these sensors work 24 7 they send data uh, to the cloud and that is where the beauty begins where uh, the artificial intelligence engine kicks in and it, it will start to digest data. And like I said before, a, child, a child's brain with uh, no data is how a form starts at the beginning. And then the system uh, uh, gains knowledge uh, uh, based on what it has learned from other forms, right? No personal identifi identifiable information is used in the process of artificial intelligence, but it is only uh, the information pertaining to what needs to be done to maintain air water balance all 24-7 uh, all through the day uh, in a particular uh, plot of a farm. So the system, based on its uh, past learnings, will be able to identify a logic of uh, uh, how to maintain the air water balance in, let's say, this blue, um, uh, uh, blue uh, uh, plot or green plot or, or, or the orange plot and uh, how it does um, uh, the artificial intelligence finally the, uh, uh, you know uh, gets into set of instructions so how would those instructions be uh, perhaps uh, on the blue plot uh, it may irrigate uh, let's say between 3 a.m and 3 20 a.m and then it may irrigate again at let's say 11 55 uh, to 12 5. So it may do one irrigation a day, it may do uh, two irrigations a day, three irrigations a day, or it may do one irrigation for three, three days or four days. Uh, and these are decisions that are taken by the system on its own. Uh, the only goal is to make sure uh, 24 hours, all through the day and night, the air water balance is maintained, which means uh, the soil never goes dry, nor does the soil become saturated. So this is the basic principle uh, of uh, Groton. And while such irrigation uh, take place, if you can look at the uh, tanks on top. So, so before that, so uh, a farm may have uh, one pump, two pumps, three pumps. Uh, and uh, uh, during, the, during the time of irrigation, the system again takes a decision as to which is the right pump to irrigate this plot. So it may turn on uh, in, in cases where there, are, there is more than a pump, uh, the, the system automatically takes a decision as to pump A may be used while irrigating uh, the blue plot, while probably pump 2 will be used to irrigate uh, the orange plot, and uh, probably both of them will be used simultaneously to irrigate uh, another plot. So these are decisions again uh, taken autonomously uh, using the artificial intelligence engine that is built into the platform. And while doing so, uh, now if you can look at the tanks that I have uh, uh, drawn on top of it, uh, these are tanks that will hold 
the stock solutions of uh, uh, different nutritions. Now you can have uh, you know one tank, two tanks, ten tanks, fifteen tanks, you know whatever as required. And uh, uh, Groton has the ability to open the right tank uh, and uh, inject the right amount of fertilizers uh, at the right time. So what I mean by at, at the right time is that, um, like we saw in the previous slide, uh, for the photosynthesis to be effective, the air water ha balance has to be maintained and the 16 minerals have to be made available. So when the minerals are uh, made available, if there is no air water balance, then again, there is no uh, real benefit. Therefore, uh, the, uh, uh, the objective is to inject the minerals or the nutrition when the air water balance uh, is maintained in the soil. So in other words, uh, if assuming there is no power uh, for a couple of days and therefore the land is uh, fully dry or it has rained for the last uh, two days and the soil is completely saturated. In these kinds of uh, situations, it makes very little sense uh, to do, to do uh, nutrition management. Therefore, the system uh, looks at all the real-time situations and takes a decision uh, both in terms of irrigation and uh, fertilization. And all that I talked about so far are uh, uh, common things for both open form and uh, protected structures like a polyhouse or a net house or what is commonly known as a greenhouse. Now, there are uh, a couple of uh, uh, additional features that we have built specifically for uh, protected structures. One, it can operate fan and pad uh, to maintain the temperature. It can operate foggers to manage the humidity. So, and uh, uh, if the sunlight becomes too bright uh, and leads to scorching of the plants, uh, it can automatically close a curtain and uh, uh, when the situation becomes normal, it can uh, automatically open the curtain again. And uh, in a fully closed polyhouse, I mean, in India, you see most of the polyhouses are uh, a type called naturally vent ventilated polyhouses. But if it is a, a perfectly sealed polyhouse, then what can happen uh, inside the polyhouse is that um, after the photosynthesis begins early in the morning, at some time, maybe, maybe 10 or 11 or 12, uh, the photosynthesis will uh, stop or is more likely to stop because there will be no carbon dioxide left within the structure, which is why uh, in, in most of the uh, polyhouses in countries like Netherlands, you will see carbon dioxide being injected after uh, about 10, 10, 30 in the morning. So what Grotron also can do is it can uh, sense the level of carbon dioxide and uh, see if that is sufficient. If it is not sufficient, then uh, it can in fact inject carbon dioxide either uh, from the cylinders or by turning on a carbon dioxide generator. Either way, it can inject and then uh, again use the air circulation fans to make sure that the carbon dioxide has been really circulated uh, all across uh, the polyhouse because uh, all of you may know uh, carbon dioxide is in fact heavier than air. Therefore, as soon as you inject, it is likely that they come settle down somewhere at the bottom of uh, the structure not necessarily circulate all over. So this can, in fact, circulate all over and make sure with the different sensors uh, kept in different places, uh, make sure that they have really been circulated and it is even uh, everywhere in the, in the uh, polyhouse. And uh, uh, on top of that, um, in India, we always have this uh, grid issue, power uh, related problems. So one, uh, Groton has the ability to sense the quality of grid and make sure the uh, uh, you know farm operations are done only within uh, the time available uh, uh, for irrigation or fertilization. At the same time, if the farm has a backup power, then uh, Groton has the ability to automatically turn that on. It could be a generator, it could be an inverter, whatever it is. It can turn that on and do all the activities that is necessary and turn off uh, the generator or any backup power. Uh, when it is no more necessary. And uh, the, the last feature that I wanted to uh, explain uh, is the traceability. So this is a beautiful traceability that we have uh, uh, included in the system where every harvest can be recorded. Uh, the farmer gets the choice to record the first quality, the second quality, and the discard quality. And if he chooses to, he can also indicate the price. Although the price is not visible to anybody else except him, uh, it is his choice whether he wants to record that or not. Uh, but by doing so, 
the system generates a QR code which can be used uh, for him to communicate with the middleman or the end consumer to build a confidence about uh, the, the, culti uh, the cultivation methodologies used in the farm, the fertilizer, fertilizers used in the farm, the, uh, you know, the pest control mechanisms, all of that can be disclosed. Again, what uh, is disclosed depends on what the farmer chose uh, to disclose. So uh, this, we believe, can, can establish a very strong uh, trust on the farmer and the bond between farmer and the consumer. Next slide, please. So, uh, so generally, uh, the drip irrigation is used in plantations and vegetables. What we have done is we also took that to paddy, pulses and cereals. And uh, as we speak in the campus of Tamil Nadu Agri Univers Agricultural University, uh, Grotron is uh, running a farm uh, with paddy. Uh, so we are expecting the results shortly, maybe in about a month's time. Um, so uh, this platform, because it is able to maintain the air water balance and manage the uh, nutrition uh, very appropriately, we have seen productivity increase of a minimum 30% in any crop. And in some cases, like the example that I had given before, uh, where the increase was 20 times, although that is not um, very prevalent, a minimum, minimum of 30% is uh, you know, definitely seen in every sim uh, single commercial installations that we have done. And water saving of anywhere between 30 and 70 percent. This is the need of the hour uh, because uh, in the next generation, generation after, we do not know whether we are going to have uh, surplus water for the uh, for the people. So water saving is a real key uh, uh, important uh, criteria. And the fertilizer reduction is anywhere between 10 and uh, 35 percent. Uh, so these are some of the major benefits, and of course. Uh, 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 the artificial uh, intelligence driven fertilizer management and supply is something that we are going to launch in a month's time and harvest pred prediction and connecting with the suppliers and uh, buyers it is already there launched as uh, beta and uh, the commercial launch of this will happen by December this uh, uh, year and pest and disease identification and remedy we are working on this subject with, a, with another partner of ours uh, from Spain, uh, so a company in Spain that specializes in uh, pest and disease identification and identification, and uh, we are working on the auto remedy uh, part of it. So both of us will, uh, you know, combine our, our solutions together, and this should be available uh, uh, as part of Grotron standard feature by June 2022. Next slide, please. Uh, so, all of us know about the United Nations uh, Sustainable Goals. So, the uh, ones with black tick marks are the ones that we think we are participating in and we are contributing uh, to the United Nations Sustainability Goals. Next slide, please. So, uh, we have a goal of covering about 1.86 lakh acres uh, uh, with Grotron over the next uh, uh, five years. And if we did that, uh, what we can talk about is about 52,000 crore liters of water saved in a year, in every single year, and which directly translates to saving of about 3,500 megawatt of electricity and about 20 to 30 percent reduction in fertilizer usage and approximately 600 crores of additional income in the hands of farmers and uh, uh, labor dependency will be brought down. Uh, as far as crop care is concerned to near zero. I mean, we all know how difficult it is to get labor today. Uh, and the kind of intelligence that a system is able to throw uh, up now, uh, we believe it is likely to throw, uh, throw open doors for uh, some sort of a rural entrepreneurship driven by hyperlocal uh, intelligence. And we are already seeing a signs of uh, reverse migration and we think that technological interventions of this kind can encourage that and get a lot of these uh, uh, intelligent people uh, who migrated to urban areas to come back and then look back into the agriculture again. And the most important thing is all the data that the system is generating is all autonomous. There is no human in intervention. Uh, there is nothing called a data entry. It is all uh, captured on its own by the system. Therefore, we also believe in the longer run, this data can help in assisting insurance companies, banks uh, in giving crop loans and things like that. And uh, potentially can also help the, the planning bodies of the governments uh, to take some real data when it comes to 
making their next one year plan or five years plans. Next slide, please. So this is how uh, the 360 degree agree, agree ecosystem of Grotron is going to work. So Grotron as a, te a technology is in the middle and uh, we, uh, the buyers will be connected to the farmer. Say for example, a buyer is looking for organic tomato. So the farmers who are growing organic tomatoes will be automatically connected. So on the context, it is context driven. And similarly, uh, the farmer needs, let's assume, um, uh, he's using, let's say, a brand called uh, Combo Experts. The only suppliers who can supply Combo Experts will be connected to the farmer uh, automatically. So what happens in this process is that the farmer is not limited by one buyer. The farmer is not limited by only one supplier. So he gets a wide variety of choices to make. And uh, the farmers do uh, rate the suppliers and buyers. Therefore, at some point, for the other farmers, uh, they get an idea about who they can trust and buy or who they can trust and sell. And similarly, other service providers like the tractors, the harvesters, get information about uh, who they can approach, which farmer they can approach, when and for what. And uh, so like this, the platform uh, as of today, in, in its, uh, as its structure, is able to make all these connections, but we are in the process of making it more mature and robust. So which is why uh, this ecosystem today is in its uh, beta launch, uh, not really commercially launched, but we, f we, we find that the uh, automatic artificial intelligence based connection is about 85% accurate uh, as of today. Next slide, please. So this is how the data is represented uh, through mobile apps and uh, desktops. So everything that happens in a farm uh, will be uh, uh, you know, made available to the farmers. Like you can see graphs, data point, the maps on the map. When you look at the map itself, you will know uh, what is happening in the farm. It is getting irrigated or uh, fertilization is taking place. The soil is dry or uh, uh, the air water balance is maintained. All of that through the uh, different color codes, you will know. Uh, and along with the tons of data that uh, today uh, we can't imagine a farm to give. Next slide, please. So these are some of the pictures. Uh, a key thing that I wanted to mention is that the uh, uh, what you see here on the left side is a solar powered uh, uh, IoT device. So what the, this device does is it will harvest power from the solar and store it in a small battery. Uh, and uh, that power in the battery will be used to turn on or off the solenoid valves as well as to power the sensors. And in a hypothetical scenario, uh, the sun does not uh, come for three days, for example. The device can still uh, open and close the valves for three full days and uh, will have enough power to uh, read the sensors and send back to the cloud. So what is important here is that uh, because of this, this is our patented technology, and because of this, uh, there is zero wiring inside the farm. Usually, when you hear about farm automation, there will be kilometers of wiring, especially in large farms, uh, from the pump room all across. But here, we have a system uh, where there is zero wiring whatsoever. Next slide, please. Yeah, so these are some of the sample screens. Uh, you can just keep going to the next slides. So the intent of these uh, screens are just to tell you that uh, there is so much information that we can throw open. These are only sample screens, but the idea is to let you know that there are uh, you know, uh, tons of insights that we can uh, give you uh, about any form. And uh, a couple of awards, these two are awards we received from the government of India. Next slide, please. This is again a list of uh, awards from the government, from uh, different bodies in India, like uh, 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 the go uh, both government and private bodies and also outside India. So thank you so much and uh, hope this information was useful. And I think we have a, a Q&A uh, towards the end of the session and I'll be uh, glad to answer any questions you may have then. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Yuvraj, sir, you would like to say something? Uh... No, nothing, nothing. Uh, thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, we'll do the question and answer session in the end, probably. Yeah. Uh, so there are quite a few questions uh, are there, including uh, ourselves as well as our startups. We'll sure. definitely uh, address as a panel. Sure. You can move forward, Jina, please. Okay. Uh, 
so before we move forward, I request uh, all the attendees to keep using chat box to address their question to the respective speaker. Um, thank you, Benjamin, sir, again. We move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker for the day is Mr. Sunu Thomas. He's a software professional with uh, substantial experience in the field of sustainable agriculture. Presently, as the partner in senior technology, he heads the research and development department. Uh, I request Mr. Sunu Thomas to take the session forward. Sir, are you able to hear us? Yes, uh, yes, I'm able to ah, hear. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh? yeah, we can hear you. We can see you. Well, yeah. Uh, good morning. Uh, is is there a way you can present my slides just like you had done for Benjamin? Yes, yes, yes. Kaushik, can you do that? Yes, sir. We are doing that. Give us a moment. Okay. So yeah. So uh, let me tell you my background. So we. Uh, basically a software company and I, I also do ag tech consultancy. So some of them we take it, take it through the company and some of them we, uh, do it outside, um, as a separate consultant. So, yeah, so, uh, I started off in, into getting interested in agriculture probably around 12 years back and then seeing what was going wrong. Um, so I, uh, kind of decided that, uh, you know, we got to merge agriculture and technology in the right way. And I was seeing all around my friends creating different kinds of startups in the agri sector. Um, some of some of them were too ambitious and uh, some of them were pretty slow. And, but uh, they are uh, succeeding. So, uh, yes, a lot of things in agriculture we can solve using uh, technology. But uh, we need to get to understand the plant a little better if you're going to be, you know, helping the whole ecosystem. So the kind of stuff that we do is we work with uh, dairies in uh, southern Europe. Um, uh, we did a blockchain uh, sample implementation uh, for a, a large provider uh, for uh, ensuring the quality of seed. Right now, I'm working with a company called uh, an Australian company called uh, Go Micro, and we are trying to get it into some of the largest, uh, uh, you know, grain producers in India. But of course, there are challenges. Uh, Go Micro is making a a device which can assess the quality of grain as well as corn. But again, it's a neural uh, network-based system. Your AI neural network-based system. So. There are challenges because you finally have to meet the QC. So, yeah, so what people do not know is how smart plants are. And when you start seeing that, you're going to uh, look at it from an entirely different point of view. So let me take, take it from my farm itself. So from my, in my farm, I practice something known as permaculture, which is basically the entire thing is tree-based, and then you have uh swales and small ponds you so people think that there's no technology involved but we can use drones to basically you know uh find the elevation of the land at different points and uh, uh and few technologies like that so uh i i i i've uh, i'm at the cusp of technology and agriculture so you know so if a tech guy says this this is good for agriculture. I can say yes or no because I have that uh, kind of experience in that. Plus, my writing has been well read on LinkedIn about technology is good in certain certain way, but if you are if you will be surprised at some of the technologies that are doing really well in India. Like for example, there's a guy named Rikin Gandhi, and his company is known as Digital Green, and all they do is create videos by farmers for by farmers or other farmers, and that is doing extremely well, whereas some extremely high-tech companies, they're not doing so well. The reason is there's a mismatch between uh, what the farmer can afford, what what uh, what makes value to him versus what is being offered. So, so many people enter this ag tech uh, uh, domain with the notion that they already know agriculture. Right, uh, so it is that you know their grandfather would have had a farm, so they they would they say they would think they know, but things are much more complex than uh, what it seems. Uh, even uh, even right from the production to trade, we are living in a 
highly susceptible environment of climate change. I've seen it myself. So I have been able to mitigate some of the issues uh, climate change has caused uh, in my farm. And uh, of course, I'm not uh, being in technology. I'm not agnostic to uh, what technology is used, but careful use of technology. Yes, at the right time, it makes sense and value. So let me start off with my first slide, which which could be a shocker for many people. The that was a can plants count, right? So plants do seem to count up to two. If you see the Venus flytrap, there are electrical signals provided uh, by the plant um, based on uh, how a, a fly enters the, uh, the the flower, right? Uh, so can we go to the next slide? I'll quickly run through these slides, yeah. This is about plants having feelings. So, so they would be able to communicate yeah, and they, are they conscious? So there are researchers who say uh, they are, they have a level of consciousness. So basically, what my theme of AgTech is basically close to, as close to nature as possible, bring in only minor in interventions as necessary. I'm a big fan of vertical farms, and I basically have a friend who has a you know a, a LED array company uh, uh, in the United States, and then we were trying a few things, for example, uh, grow saffron in, indoor in uh, Madhya Pradesh, right? So being a consultant, you get to know and do many of these things and meet the different kind of stakeholders, not just farmers, right? Including the uh, intermediate, intermediary traders uh, and then the even the end customers. So the challenges are many. Uh, the challenges are many. Uh, but I think we are on the right path. There, there will be, as, as of now, as you know, there's a ag tech boom. Uh, there will be winners and there will be, you know, losers in this game. But that's uh, that's a, that's common with entrepreneurship. So we, so we take a, as a company, take a, you know, a much more softer approach, a much more, you know, risk-free approach where we implement on the on the customers' needs. Some of them on the customers' needs. And uh, can you go to the next slide? So AgTech, we're just beginning. So among the things I do, which are not mentioned in the slides also, is like I'm also promoting a, a, a growth solution, which was uh, created by, you know, uh, ex-CEO uh, of uh, uh, Pasture Institute in Uti. So we are basically trying to bring the bacteria and fungi uh, and uh, you know the growth levels in the plant, which which some of the organic uh, folks like uh, Pamela Maroon in the United States, and they say that hey, this is this is all you need, right? So we can we can reduce the amount of fertilizer, which is highly expensive, and it comes from maybe our potash comes from Morocco, Canada, Russia. Same thing with uh, phosphorus. So that. Many of things can be avoided if you're going to be doing things in in a forest kind of way. But also you can do when you're close to the city, you can also do these vertical farms and like Benjamin said, this, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it? Poly houses, right? <coughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you can go to the next slide, please. So if you see the left hand picture and the right hand picture, you should you can see how much we have evolved over the course of history. But I want you to look at this. I want you to look at this picture more closely in the sense that what is utility for an average farmer? This is, this is one of the most important points. What is utility for an average farmer? It is still the plow, right? Because the farmer is able to repair himself, or if it's, even if it's a little more expensive, then there's a network of people who can repair it. It works. It if the uh, you know the uh, if the system is so simple that if the with a slight tweak, it works 99% of the time. It does not need batteries. It is dependable. Whereas today's systems, it is still maturing, 
and we will definitely come to a point where you can do something what you've seen on the right side where you can see uh, an image recognition based on different kinds of the fruit growth level as well as uh, uh, what you call the uh, if it is diseased, etc. So this is one what uh, one uh, thing I'm currently working on with this company called the Go Micro. <coughs> so that's only for grain. We do realize how difficult it is because uh, you know the sometimes the network doesn't realize it because of the lighting conditions and uh, uh, or maybe an internal error. So we are getting there, and uh, I think uh, government of India is currently the Go Micro products are trialed at even. FCI. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, it's over the course of human history. Where did we start and where are we now? What understanding we did we have then and what understanding do we have now? So the plans, as you know, with my deep respect for these plans, we do only recently that we are probably around 30, 40 years that we have come to realize that a plan does commerce at the lower end. If you see the enlarge the picture on the right side, you can see the amount of interactions it has with microbes, it has with fun, uh, different fungi, nematodes. So what is it? What is it that happens underneath the soil? We're just learning that. So. I heard from some top researchers that we as human beings know only 15% of the biology of things. One five. If anybody says they know more than 15%, they're basically lying. So we are working on a in an eco, sorry in an ecosystem where our knowledge is around 15%. Uh, and then so it's, that means that we're not we'll not be able to say for sure whatever intervention that we apply is going to work in a certain way. Another thing that, so I look at it from a wholesome point of view, wherever, you know, a, with a limited amount of tech, uh, technology that you can do things, we go ahead and do it. For example, sorting of grain, sorting of grain is something, uh, or even maintaining the quality of grain got from different providers uh, is something that everybody is looking on. Can you go to the next slide? <coughs> yeah. If you see, this is India's eco uh, ecosystem of, I'm not, I'm not mentioning some of them. Uh, sorry, uh, apologize for the incompleteness, but uh, yeah, this is, you know, a set of these companies which are trying to bring in tech, but uh, there are risks and challenges probably in this slide itself uh 60 to 70 percent of them will fail at some point of time uh which is the same with uh, the next slide which is uh can you put the next slide there? yeah this is a an american one uh, or worldwide one where uh, those categories right from industrial automation to vertical farms to soil uh, uh, additives to uh genetically mo genetic modification is happening and i've seen many of them come and go i've seen many of them come and go and i know the reasons why they succeed and why they fail for example the simplest of technologies is what a company like digital green gives which is just video just video and you know it turns out to be pretty successful at that because first thing the farmers need is a kind of knowledge, right? Yeah, another thing I would like to, I probably wrote around 10 years back is, I wrote around 10 years back, I was trying to figure out why, coming from an engineering background, how is it similar to Agritech? And if you look at it, some of the requirements are quite similar, right? So an engineering manager would work with a set of parameters like people, um, tools, the market, and a few other things. But if you see during the course of producing uh, any product, any of these parameters won't vary from 10 to 20%. Whereas if you look at the farmer's set of parameters that he has, he has the soil, he has the weather, he has rainfall, the market. 
I would see in a place like uh, Goodalpet, you know, which is like close to, I mean, you know, a Karnataka border town. A lot of these farmers will have a heavy crop of tomatoes. And then the cost of transporting is what happens when you have a large crop is the price crashes. I think you all know that. Uh, so there are no buyers at that time when they realize that there's a large uh, production. The sorry, sorry. See the 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 and the price in the market just crashes, and uh, I've seen them dump tomatoes on the road because that was the only viable option for them. So this is happening all over India where people dump milk, where they dump uh, tomatoes and other vegetable produce. Just because once you have a, so we have a two sided problem. When we have low production, again, the farmer is going to be in distress. When he has a very high production, again, he's in distress, unless he has forward contracts which can hedge in the market, or, or he has a customers who have signed upfront. That's not very mature yet. Uh, you can go. You can go to the next slide, yeah. Yeah, so there's some of the IITs are, are uh, getting into agri-tech and they're publishing papers. Uh, some of the TNAU, they are also, uh, you know, a very good, uh, you know, support in the agri-tech, uh, although I've not worked with them. Uh, yeah, you go to the next slide, so. Yeah, so long before agri-tech became a fashion, we had our satellites, you know, mapping out rainfall patterns, map, map, mapping out the growth patterns. This is what is today. We have companies like Satcho, uh, which is extending this by, you know, and uh, uh, NDVI detection. Okay, so to figure out if plants have diseased. There's a guy named Tim Neal in Australia who does that. This uh, satellite based. Uh, detection very well, and uh, Australia being much less complex than the Indian terrain, where you know in, in in an average Indian terrain there is a lot of these trees plus our monsoons during our monsoons where the growth growth where people do the maximum planting, you know some of these satellite based things may not really work. So I did talk to I was talking to the you know the guy who used to head uh, Watson. Uh, agree, uh, IB, IBM's Watson agree, and he gave me an earful about why we cannot use much of the satellite sensing during, especially during the monsoons, and uh, uh, because there's only a uh, limited amount of data you can collect during the monsoons. Uh, but uh, yeah, by and then, our satellites are doing a good job understanding the macro level of stuff, micro level of stuff. That needs some more work outside. Go to the next slide. <clears throat> yeah, so this is Stellabs uh, is currently one of the agri tech success stories. So if you look at it, the the cha the challenge of measuring the milk every day morning at a milk collection center. Yeah, one of the things I was also working at for a European. Uh, dairy processor is they need to detect the quality of fat and protein uh, from every single milk tank that's going to supply to them. We're talking about around 60,000 milk tanks. But the challenge is there are sensors that do that, but the cost of uh, a sensor in that range of 5,000 euros, the cost of a sensor which can detect milk and protein at runtime. Sorry, fat and protein and, uh, at runtime. Basically, you are doing an infrared analysis of it. So, and that is not. So, we're working on with some partners and trying to get us, you know, much cheaper solution for this because uh, one of the reasons is in milk people do dilute. Plus, another thing is milk gets boiled fast, and if you're not using the right kind of milk tank, you know, you're going to get into those kind of issues. Uh, yeah, and that is why we're trying to solve that with technology. Yeah, uh, can go to the next slide. Yeah, it's again about Stell Labs. Uh, yeah, so uh, what I yeah, so you you would by now know that uh, I have understood that you know this is entrepreneurship in agri is risky, but it's rewarding as well. 
and uh, all those the cycle is will take much more time than your normal you know entrepreneurship in software uh, ha uh, yeah hardware is hardware by its nature is you know it takes much more uh, time because of the ecosystem your uh, a truck roll for a bad device so we try to get into these companies many of these companies through software, just by trying to sell software. But some of them come back and say, hey, we need those sensors to attach to your software. And that's where we get into the hardware part, and which is which is a little bit difficult, right? You can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so this is one, uh, I mean, I just put a slide for, uh, this is something like growth on, and this is, a, uh, I think, uh, North Asian, North Asian company, which, which sells uh, the NIOT sensor based item for mainly for date palm industry. And uh, yeah, yeah, so basically the same picture I think Benjamin had shown. So they figure out wind, moisture, solar panel powered uh, data logging. Yeah, and then a user interface. Yeah, you can go to the next slide. Yeah, so this uh, we did have a conversation with QSense. They're they're doing right now that uh, company I talked about, Go Micro. They do it through a lens which they attach to the back of a phone, uh, and there are uh, flatbed scanners in that too, uh, that area too. Whereas uh, QSense is a diff slightly different, uh, you know, method to for this uh, food quality testing, and that's. Uh, uh, one is the visible spectrum, and then is the olfactory sensors for this fresh food. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so this is an important thing. This is an important slide where, which is one of the, you know, my, uh, uh, my, uh, what do you call, it? where I don't believe the world needs to be monocropped. It is a personal take at this, and I've argued multiple times. And it is part of the in today in the United States, so there's something known as regenerative uh, uh, agriculture. So, which is trying to get away from this monocrop. Monocrop is very easy for tech to come in, whereas if you can go to the next, I can show you that, right? Yeah, so this is how they sense because you know you have thousands of acres of flatland with one type of crop, you can easily find boundaries and uh, uh, and and you can try to figure out the crop too, or if it's diseased or not because you can directly observe from space these items. You can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, here you're gonna find. Doing agri tech a little bit different, difficult. I, in my coffee farm, I, I you know I use very little amount of technology. Although I am pretty much been in tech for 20, 22 to twenty three plus years, uh, I don't see the need for a deeply embedding sensors into the soil because I consider some of these plants as robots. As you've seen from some of the first slides, the amount of so each plant is a sensor too, if you look at it, uh, you know. Uh, and uh, say I try to fly a drone inside this, uh, uh, through this, I'm not going to get much success. The drone is going to hit some branch and then going to fall down, and that's uh, expected. So this is the kind of uh, agri that I kind of promote on my using, my, and also what the regenerative agriculture movement promotes. It's not that. The regenerative agriculture movement does not like technology. It's just that the technology for that is much more complex. So, uh, yeah, uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so you can use a drone plus lasers to figure out, not just by satellites alone, you can use the lasers, but the drone combination to kind of, you know, figure out how much what your ecosystem is because the lasers can bounce off different uh, objects, even trees, and then you can figure out a, a probably create a digital map 
sometime uh, at a 3d map sometime in, in the near future uh, yeah you can go to the next slide please yeah this is i think a cartoon like which i uh, you know a slide where uh, this is important where we are and uh, how you can uh, maximize on some of the ag tech that, that is currently there. If you look at uh, deep learning, water trading, all those stuff that is, they're just darting off. So for ag tech companies, which are currently making money, they're probably on the right side of things, right? The plateau of productivity, um, the slope of enlightenment, the rough you can, uh, so I think every entrepreneur needs to see this and have it as part of, uh their uh, you know the somewhere stuck to their wall or something you know this is this is how this is as far as uh, technology is concerned uh and where are we in that so you know do it do we do we take this technology or develop on this or do we have you know are we going to develop slow and steady and put it on the slow slow burn so that we can mature this technology over a period of time mm. Yeah, so this is a more, this is one important slide that I felt. So many, many of my slides I've taken up from the internet, and I apologize for any copyright violations that may be. Yeah, so exoskeletons is in a country like Japan, which is an aging population, and they don't need, uh, uh, you know, they're not willing to bring in labor from other countries. So uh, yeah, this is one of the things that we use. Yes, vertical farms. Uh, I was in an Irish accelerator for another product, and this was one company that was there, which is a Russian, a fin Finnish Russian company called IFA. Uh, Max Chisol, I know him well. So, uh, yeah, so in those areas, why this works is because it's the, the land is frozen most of the time. And, uh, uh, you know, you can use these very expensive. I think they're uh cost of like per square foot cost it comes to around uh, 800 dollars or something like that you know for to build up this ecosystem this vertical farm and you need precision uh lighting precision humidity sensing and precision air conditioning for this and uh and also precision uh, nutrient feeding uh yeah you can go to the next slide so another thing that people don't really uh, kind of pay much attention to is the man animal conflict, which is increasing. And I'm being seeing it firsthand on my farm. What's happening is because during the corona time we were mostly inside, the animals are taking over the wild boars, the deer. I'm having trouble with them. Them, the elephant comes once in a while. So there's a lot of technology that needs to be developed in that area. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Hello. Am I on? Yes, you are. Kaushik, can you move to the next slide? Yeah, so this is our last slide. Right, so uh, just give us a minute. So what we do? I hope the slide is moving, sir. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah it has moved. Yeah. Yeah, so my claim to fame probably might be my writing, uh, and that is got uh, pretty good international exposure. Uh, in vertical farming uh, or, you know, engaging some companies in vertical farming. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much how it is for myself. So, Yeah, we can take questions or. So we'll be taking question and answers post the presentation of the third speaker. Okay. All right. I think we just lost it right like a minute ago. Anyway, anyway, it's fine now. 
Okay, uh, th thank you, sir. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, we'll move on to the next speaker. Our next speaker for the day is Mr. Suzanne Shugupta, the co founder of InnoFarms. Uh, InnoFarms is a young startup working in the domain of post harvest technology. They are tackling the enormous fruit wastage in the fruit industry, resulting in uh, lower fruit availability. They have innovated a fruit processing unit uh, which can be installed at the farm gate itself. I request Mr. Suzanne Shu to take over the session. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Zeenat. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, like, uh, it would be helpful if you can show the presentation as well on the screen. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so. Basically, I'm Sudan Shugupta, co-founder of InnoFarms, and uh, we are basically into the post-harvest management. So, until now, the discussion was around what to be done during the harvest or pre-harvest. We are more focused on the post-harvest. <laughs> so, the first slide is talking about like uh, the amount of wastages which are happening in the supply chain of any fruits and vegetable. So, at the end of the day, we have to provide food to the consumers or food to the population. All the automation required for the pre harvest and during the harvest are required so that we have sufficient supply available. But if the supply cannot be protected well, then the additional supply will, will not have a big meaning. In India or any other developing nation, majority of the waste stage, if you look at this uh, data point, it comes from uh, the government of India. The majority of the waste stage is happening at the farm gate or near farm gate. And uh, I think uh, the presenters before me have uh, very clearly mentioned why these waste stages are happening uh, because of the cold storages and uh, like uh, we all know that the lack of farm mechanization, poor road conditions and all these results in the post harvest losses, particularly in the perishable fruits and vegetables, where these har post harvest losses are significant. And what it results in is a uh, low income to the farmers because roughly 10 to 15 percent or sometimes even more number like 25 percent of the crop is getting wasted, uh, maybe because of the natural uh, climatic reasons or uh, just the market was not available at that particular time. For an example, like uh, this year, uh, the fruits, uh, there was a pretty good harvest, but uh, the market was not that much available. So farmers did not get any income over there. Then uh, our target is to provide all the nutrients to the consumers or to the population and lack this wastage results in low food availability. And certainly the another environmental impact is the greenhouse gas emission. Moving to the next slide. So this is uh, just to reiterate uh, on the point mentioned by me that uh, in the developing or underdeveloped nations, we see that the majority of the wastage which happens is at the production or handling and storage. So before the processing happens and only in the developed nations, we see that the consumption at the consumption level, the wastage is significant. So focusing on this particular part that we need to somehow reduce the wastage or somehow uh, make the better use of the crop, which is not finding the Monday or the market immediately, particularly in country like India, we started working on the concept of Inno farms that uh, there should be a processing mechanism or at least the primary processing mechanism which can be done at the farm level by a small to marginal farmer. And uh, that product can then be either uh, supplied to B2B supply channel or can be marketed directly in form of the branded product. Moving to the next slide. Uh, this uh, thought process was again uh, kind of strengthened with the multiple aspects which are in our social which are from the socio-economic uh, point of view that uh, the population the Indian population is primarily a young uh, earning population 
and the consumption behaviors are changing significantly earlier people were living in bigger families the disposable income was not that high and if you look today the disposable incomes are high people want to consume uh, more innovative and uh, newer and processed product and i don't know how many of the millennials or what comes after millennials are actually going to the mandis and buying the product most of them are trying to use uh, pantry amazon pantry or grofers and things like that for the consumption particularly in the cities tier 1 tier 2 cities uh seven this is the government policies uh, next slide please yeah so government policies are also pretty favorable uh, regarding the processed and prim uh, primary processed products so with all those thoughts uh, we started working on uh, the you know farms uh, there is one more slide to give you oh, can you go ahead next slide yeah so uh, basically the point which i was mentioning the automation in farming uh, is required is the need of our but also the small scale processing because automation certainly increases the productivity more revenues will are possible for the farmers but still they are available only if the wastage is not there and the demand can be predicted so for that reason we are like we think that the processing can help in reducing the wastage and the farmers income definitely increases because either the crop will be sold in mandi if the mandi is not taking up the crop then it can be processed and can be protected for uh, one year 18 months or even more so the what solution which we came up with i'm uh, moving ahead next slide so our solution was basically to uh develop the to prepare an equipment which will be provided to farmers or fpos or shgs this equipment converts the fruits or vegetable into pulp uh, a sterilized pulp at a small uh, at a small scale and uh, then this uh, primary process product is bought back by the farmer uh, bought back from the farmers by eno farms and then eno farms further supply these uh, as a raw material to the bigger companies who are into jam juice sauces manufacturing we also started with our own brand for juices and uh, ready to eat products where this pulp was directly used and uh, the advantage was there is basically no middleman in between the unit the primary processing is happening at the farm gate so you are getting raw material which was considered of zero value at least now the farmer is getting some value and uh, we uh, get that processed we buy back uh, the primary process pulp and then it is converted into juices and other value added products so for us the revenue is basically actually three streams one is the equipment sales and then the primary process product sales and the finished product sales next slide so this uh, this is one of the snapshot of the processing equipment uh, the complete equipment comes down in 400 square feet of area and uh, though the cost uh, would look like uh, it's pretty high but with all the government subsidies and the quick roi of the unit enables farmers and uh, particularly fpos uh, to get to utilize this equipment so from harvesting you directly move to the storage and uh, then post processing and then the market sales moving ahead so the whole unit has uh, the whole equipment has been developed in house it uh, requires all like the all the things from mechanical engineering software development iotification and uh, the complete traceability so every rom every bag which is uh, of the pulp which is produced at the farm gate uh, is equipped with qr code so that uh, all the data is of the processing of the raw material of the farmer is stored in the central database and with this traceability qr code the buyer can get to know any, any possible data about the product or the farmer or anything simultaneously so this particular equipment provides uh, job creation at the rural level most of the times we see that the job people from rural areas are moving outside this uh, village area to the cities for the jobs 
but uh, with these kind of small scale processing units the jobs are available directly at the uh, village level next slide so this is actually the photograph of our first unit which is installed in uh, Savai Madhapur, Rajasthan so uh, it's a basically a small scale aseptic processing unit aseptic processing unit means like uh, uh, you get the food converted into pulp then sterilize it so you are basically killing any possible microorganism over there and then in a sterilized environment you pack it in a sterilized bag so that you don't need to use any kind of preservative you don't need any cold storage to keep the product safe so uh, this is one of the first unit and it produces roughly one tons of uh, pulp in eight hours and can be customized to fit on a truck mounted design so currently we are having uh, three units in operation and more units are going in so, uh, like while working with the farmers with this concept of decentralized agro primary processing we realize that uh, more of such units be it uh, dryers or be it paste makers or uh, or any other primary processing equipment which can reduce uh, or which can reduce the perishability nature is very welcomed by the farmers and the FPOs. So with that thought, we have developed a few more units which can help uh, in reducing the perishability. But our key focus has been on this uh, pulping unit to focus on mainly fruits and vegetables. Moving ahead. So some of the products which uh, we have already launched in the market uh, to and all the uh, like uh, the revenues are going back to the farmers in the whole supply chain moving ahead. So it was just like uh, the whole supply. Yeah, going to the next slide. So what advantage does it uh, this this kind of solution uh, brings in on the table to the rural economy? So this unit is not just like a, like uh, we have put some iron and steel on the floor. It's a complete automated unit with the like just with the press of button the production starts, and after that the dependency on the operator is more or less minimal. So all the automation uh, which we were talking in the pre-harvest or in the harvesting, we have put that automation in the post-harvest at a low cost and a small scale. So to when the operator or when one of the owner of the unit is uh, basically maintaining the equipment, their skills, we are basically upskilling the rural population and they get into the food processing sector along with it, which brings them into the tertiary economy side. Incomes for sure, they are increasing, new jobs are getting created and uh, as a like from the previous slide, you can see that we have working basically on four like uh, we have products from four totally different fruits, and the whole model has been created in such a way that the whole processing plant is created in such a way that it can be replicated without changing. But ninety five percent of the equipment remains the same. Only five percent here and there gets changed, and uh, it can be replicated, be it in north. Uh, in Jammu or be it in East uh, in Sikkim where we have, we are planning to process maybe turmeric let's say uh, that can be done oranges can be done or be it in Rajasthan where we are processing guava or pomegranate and or be it in Maharashtra where we are processing strawberry so talk about any product it can be the unit can be replicated and can be scaled and these micro entrepreneurs which are created at the uh, village level uh they are also in sync with the like i would call it a governmental target or actually the need of the hour of the country that we need to provide the entrepreneurs at the rural level not all the entrepreneurs can come from bangalore or delhi or Gurgaon. we need entrepreneurs at the rural level of at the from the places where names have not been heard yet next slide so other like the impact which uh, InnoFarms is providing, talking about the sustainable development goals. So from the point of view of uh, zero hunger or basic be it industry automation, infrastructure, responsible consumption. So again, reiterating on the same point, better income, 
better raw material or more nutrients available on the table and reduction of the greenhouse gases, better utilization of water and natural resources. So with all these uh, things in mind, and or I would call it these are the byproducts of the thought process of providing decentralized agro processing at the farm gate. Next slide. So in the supply chain of any agricultural commodity, we are right now basically focused on the processing side, or I would call it a distribution and processing side. With some of our products, we are actually also doing marketing, but our focus uh, as a company is mainly in the distribution and processing and small, like at a small level on the marketing side, because we are more focused on B2B and uh, not that much on B2C right now. So some snapshot of the team going ahead. Next slide. Yeah. So just to summarize, uh, basically it's my last slide. Yeah. The problem which we are focusing is reduction in wastage after post harvest, uh, sorry, after harvesting. So basically reducing the post harvest losses in country like India or any other developing nation with the indigenous uh, high tech solution still uh, providing jobs to the local semi skilled or unskilled uh, people of the country so next slide uh, the possibility for the expansion of such a solution can be in other technologies like uh, which i mentioned small scale harvesting washing uh, sorting packaging drying and uh, the scale up can be done in any other developing nation, be it Africa or be it South America. So, and uh, the natural forward step or natural next step for any of the farmer or the FPO with such a unit will be to get into branding and uh, providing the branded product, at least in the local community first, and then going it for the regional or the national launch. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, basically that's all from my side. We are based out of Jaipur, and our processing setups are in Jammu, in Himachal, in Rajasthan, in Maharashtra. So these are the places where the processing is currently happening. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I request uh, Mr. Yograj to start the q a session thank you thank you very much uh, all our speakers today i uh, hope uh, i'm audible can somebody can yes you are audible yes you are thank audible you, thank you very much, sir. Uh, sir this is uh, it's a question to all the speakers I, uh, as it is because it's a very common question you see most of the times when you come with a device like IOTs and all those things the cost of adoption the cost of device is very high for especially with 85 percent of the uh, farmers in india are small and marginal so please uh, address the first one uh, typically how much does it cost to adopt your particular one whether it can be gotran or other two the second question if at all if it is the cost is higher it's not affordable can it be pooled can it be pooled and used uh, by more uh, farmers more than one farmer or a group of farmers We'll go in the same order of the presentation, sir. We'll start with Benjamin, sir, followed by uh, Thomas, sir, and uh, Sudamshu. Yes, sir. Please, sir. Benjamin, sir, you can start. Okay. So, my answer to the question is uh, uh, specifically Grotron, it will cost about a lakh uh, for adoption by uh, farmer. Now, uh, to your other question, can it be pooled? Yes, uh, we have tried that. Uh, so, if uh, marginal farmers can come together, maybe four or five farms can come together and create a shared infrastructure. Then the overall cost, both in terms of replication and uh, the automation, comes really down. Uh, the second point that I would like to make is um, uh, today uh, the techn uh, technological interventions are becoming more and more must. Say, for example, a borewell uh, digging would cost you about two lakhs uh, rupees, and even marginal farmers end up digging two, three, four borewells. Uh, so now, when you try to save uh, water with just one uh, borewell that you have, would make much larger sense. Uh, therefore, the equation is not just economical, but also the uh, the benefits 
So it is a combination of economical benefits as well as ecological benefits. So people are adopting, even small small farmers are uh, adopting uh, uh, nowadays. Thank you, sir. Uh, Thomas, sir, you were there? Yeah, so our experiences with uh, you know, the United States, so we haven't dealt with the solution here. But as our intervention has been for prototypes in blockchain IoT based systems in US, so that's uh, where the affordability is much more. The uh, but the problem comes in these IoT devices is the you know the cost of truck roll. That is you know when uh, uh, you have a device on the field and the farmer is not too educated on how to solve these problems with these you know the, because these are hardware devices and problems can be expected so we have we face we have not solved that so still you know what we've done is you know, you know it is in a trial because we need uh, thing, uh, things like for a truck and iot based uh, locking systems we because you know you the seeds have to go from one uh, one generation to the next so we face, and I have been basically an IoT guy for the last 20, 24, 22 plus years, starting with embedded systems. So we, you know, that ecosystem is very well known to me. Uh, you know, so one of the challenges the rural areas face worldwide is the lack of, you know, what you call uniform internet connectivity. So it is not just that, uh, that, uh, you know there is an internet connection, but if you're going to start sending data at reliable points of time so that your system can make a decision, then you need a much better internet system too. For example, I think right now uh, Tesla, uh, not Tesla, SpaceX is coming out with a set of satellites, and and they've been very popular in the United States because you can give, give band, uh, broadband bandwidth at uh, I think a hundred dollars per month. They're giving in very uh, remote areas within the United States. So the cost of, you know, the, the cost of internet is reducing. Uh, that is uh, that is one thing that's helping the IoT ecosystem. As you know here, uh, Reliance is in a big way trying to bring 5, 5G out and uh, NB IoT based devices is uh, something that uh, is actively considered right from your building automation to uh, farm automation to uh, even traffic. So, yeah, it is not just the cost of the device alone that matters. This is a common hardware ecosystem problem. In the hardware ecosystem, how long does it take to get it replaced or fixed? So that is something that, you know, works in the psyche of the farmer or maybe somebody who is using building management systems. Even, even much more... Uh, uh, you know, uh, mature uh, ecosystems like uh, building management or, you know, airports. If you see the amount of IoT they use and the amount of servicing that needs over a period of time, it is turning out to be a challenge in many places. So definitely we are maturing. Definitely we are maturing in that uh, sector uh, where these devices are more reliable as well as, you know, the device connectivity is, is turning out to be much better. Uh, even uh, things like uh, edge devices, edge IoT devices. So though you know when you have those, the processing is in the local area. So uh, IoTs, if you look at it, the your question is slightly can be modified to what is the total cost of ownership of TCO uh, of an uh, an IoT system, right? So that is what matters, and uh, that is what many of these uh, many uh, fantastic entrepreneurs uh, are working on i think you get my point right thank you sir uh, sudanshu can you please uh... so like uh... they are pretty expensive and uh, whatever you, we do, the initial capital cost will look still pretty expensive. As an Indian farmer, what I have understood after working here for two last one and a half years is for them, the whole mindset is about kind of short term. 
that okay what can we get like uh, so over here uh, particularly in our sector we realize that the government solutions uh, like the government subsidy programs and the support from the government and the fpo models help in the adoption because the units which uh, we are proposing or which we are providing in the market they can be easily managed by FPO and the initial capital subsidy or the initial capital loan is provided by the banks, the be it nationalized bank or be it private bank. So, or if none of these solutions are available, then it comes down to the company that how do they want to uh, see this model. Like we are all in a business and business is not about doing philanthropy. So if we see that these units can provide benefits to us, uh, benefits to the business, then in that case, uh, we'll have to provide, we'll have to support the farmer by maybe providing the unit on lease or more or less like free. And uh, you have the rental payment done uh, with the every unit sold by the farmer and then you share the profit from the unit, uh, share the profit from the product sold rather than you reap in the profit at the first stage when the unit is getting sold. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Very valid point raised actually. So it's not just about the money, it's about sustainability in the long run and seeing the cost benefit analysis. Most of the times we look at a cost, we see that it's very high in cost. We will not see the long run how it's going to benefit us. So that's the first thing, sir. And a very important point added by Sudamshu also. So we well, we can give you a live example when we see a high cost of device. We have one startup, one of our startups. Uh, we, we support the grant as they recognize startups by Vairak also. What they've done, they've convinced a bank a bank uh, as a part of policy they were their devis comes as a part of their one of the schemes but there are multiple schemes proposed by banks right i think the, most of the agri startups as well as others also would know so farmers can buy some farm implements or a tractor or a similar things through a, through a various schemes of banks or government so is there, sir is there any possibility of uh, have you tried or is there any possibility of putting your device as a part of any of a bank or a nationalized bank or a private bank or a NBFCs as a part of a, a what loan or a lending arrangement. Can you please explain these things, sir? Benjamin, sir. Yes. Uh, same order, sir. Same question for all. Sure. So uh, the uh, there are a couple of schemes by the uh, government of India, uh, which the banks in the last mill are executing. So they have a mandate to fund for agriculture projects. Unlike earlier, uh, they have a mandate, which means uh, th there is a certain amount of money allocated uh, uh, at every agriculture branch of mainstream banks, which they have to fund. So what we're now doing is we found three or four schemes that, uh, that are uh, meaningful and uh, we connect the banks. And in fact, we uh, work uh, between the bank and uh, the farmers and make sure they're able to get the money. See, one of the issues in uh, funding for agriculture is that um, the if uh, the farm land is taken as a collateral, uh, the bank really will not be able to sell it, unlike a house that they take as a collateral. Uh, on the other hand, the government has mandated that the, the crop loans or the infrastructure loans uh, for the farms are given with no additional uh, collateral, but just the farm. So. Uh, there is an eligibility of up to 25 lakhs Indian rupees uh, for a farm, as long as the value of the uh, commercial value of the farm is uh, equivalent to or more than 25 lakhs. So this scheme is what we uh, use uh, pretty much in all cases where we connect the farmers and banks and quite successful. So when the capital uh, is raised through the borrowed money and the, when the farmer is disciplined and our technology helps in ensuring the productivity is achieved, this whole thing works hand in hand and really works well. So the, there are many schemes available and one of the schemes, I do not remember the name of the scheme, but the eligibility is 25 lakhs maximum. So uh, that is one scheme that uh, really works very well. We have probably helped uh, more than 50, 60 farmers uh, uh, take that fund uh, to invest on both uh, drip irrigation and uh, uh, growth round. And, and also they use uh, the excess money for uh, 
you know, bed formation, uh, the crop expenses, all of that. The scheme covers the whole project cost, not just one uh, capital equipment. So there are schemes. So farmers have to watch out for it. And if anybody needs some information about this, they can uh, uh, reach out to me. I can share. Uh, I mean, off my head, I don't recall the scheme names and things like that. But if anybody wants it, they can reach out to me and I can share the information. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We will be sharing all the contact details of our uh, panelists today so that you can write to them and get all the details. Uh, I'd request the uh, other two speakers, if you have anything to add, please uh, pitch in. Sudam, should like to add anything on to that? Um, no, I think he has covered uh, uh, pretty much about the schemes. And uh, yeah, one thing is uh, your average farm holding in India is less than uh, five acres. And on average, farmer is already indebted, right? So he would have since it's a political thing that, you know, multiple loan waivers and uh, his credit rating is pretty low. That's, you know, so we, if you look at, you know, the tearing, you know, the, of the farmers, you have probably around five pound farmers in India who are credit worthy. Credit worthiness is, a, you know, that's something that you need to, I mean, you know, uh, kind of like look at because banks will never lend to somebody who has bad credit, right? So, uh, the, sorry, uh, the credit rating, right? So that is something that, uh, you know, it is a push-pull effect because how do you see more, many farmers, uh, I mean, you know, in, especially where I, the, the area I farm in, <clears throat> many farmers, they, they take loans and they're not, they spend it on their daughter's weddings and, you know, they uh, spend it on a multitude of other things. But uh, that financial discipline is kind of lacking, and nobody has really taught them this financial discipline. So you can't really blame them for that, right? So uh, I think uh, you know there was some. I think uh, ten years, seven, eight years back, uh, Kerala government had a fifty percent subsidy for uh, you know poly house, right? So even in uh, in Hosur, I had a friend who were doing who was doing poly house, and then I think he had also some subsidy. The problem is when you have a large crop, what do you do with that? What do you do with the large crop? Once you have a large crop, people realize that you know even in the neighborhood, you know the uh, uh, the value is so. What they did, uh, I, uh, you know, they did multiple things. I have I know a friend who did multiple things like chrysanthemums. They did uh, auto flowers. They did uh, a, a few vegetables. But the problem is, if you don't have up upfront contracts with say. Uh, buyers, right? Some large chain like Reliance or something like that, you know, the APMZs and stuff like that are not much help. So, you know, uh, so there are certain, for example, in the coffee sector, there are, uh, there are buyers who actually fund the farmers, right? Uh, they actually, uh, uh, a, you know, they pay upfront for the produce. This is the basis of your futures trading. If you look at it, right? So they pay upfront for the produce four to five months ahead of it, right? So I know I'm well aware of that, uh, well aware of that. But uh, yeah, for banks, even you know the bank when banks look at it, they have even blacklisted districts, right? So there's a bank rating. So if you know if you are from a particular district, which is a farm district, and uh, your uh, your average indebtedness is high, then you know the uh, your that area's indebtedness is high. Uh, then uh, banks won't even look at your specific credit history because they're going to look at the entire uh, district's credit history, right? So I, I don't know if you're aware of this. Uh, there was this uh, uh, gold agri loan uh, kind of thing, you know, which the banks were doing, right? The gold thing. So what what really happened is people in cities they would show ten cents of land and they would pledge their gold and take that loan. So that 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 was a lo loophole which I think currently the government is trying to address and close, but it did happen, right? So getting the banks to fund for your technology, that's one thing. It has to go, it, ha it has to be, uh, you know, the technology that you have, it has to be seen somewhat like a Mahindra tractor, right? Banks will readily fund you if you're in Punjab or in a grain growing uh, area, if you have a good uh, credit history, they're going to fund you for the tractor, right? So all this equipment, they know this life cycle of this like, equipment. 
how what repairs may come what repairs and uh, how what will they get if they sell it whereas iot uh, things like iot is just maturing out here you know, right the, i mean uh, i mean i had a my friend had a poly house and he had to spend i think almost seven, seven eight eight months trying to get it dismantled and sell it to somebody else this is in hosur uh, which is like close to back road so yeah i mean this, this whole thing leads a little more i mean uh, getting maturity but i think we are we are proceeding the right way if you see look at it Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Sudam, should you like to add anything before we move to the next question? Not much. I think the both points are covered. So banks do have the policies oh. and as mentioned, uh, that these banks don't uh, uh, provide loans to some of these districts. But yeah, this will take time before any of these new technologies will become uh, adopted like uh, tractors or anything. Tractors did not get adopted by the banks on the day one. It also took some time. So we have to just wait and watch. True. Yeah. So uh, before you proceed to the next question, I just want to add one point. So one of the points that Mr. Daniel said was valid about uh, the bank loan waivers and the discipline of the farmers. So I just would like to give a cl clarity here so that the audience understand that clearly. So, so far, the loans to the, to, to the farmers were given through a structure called uh, cooperative banks. And all the state governments and sometimes even the uh, union government uh, used to announce uh, waivers and subsidies and uh, you know call of the loans. Uh, but now the schemes that I'm talking about are through the mainstream banks, either private or public. So uh, they do look at, uh, I mean, unlike a cooperative bank, these loans are not that easy to get. Uh, so people who have failed in their cooperative bank repayment don't get this loan. So in a way, what Mr. Daniel said is right. Not everybody can get this loan. Uh, real, uh, you know, disciplined farmers can certainly get, but people who have really abused the system uh, may not be able to get the loans that I referred to, which are through the mainstream banks. Okay, thank you for the uh, ground reality and output, sir. So uh, now we'll open the question to our attendees today. Let them ask because. Uh, so it will give them an indirect interaction opportunity also. So there are some people already raised their hands. So we'll request them. Mr. Ravi Kumar. Yes, sir. Yeah, Ravi Kumar, you can ask your question, please. Yeah, my question is to direct to Benjamin Raja, which means uh, Daniel, sir. My question is you are uh, having uh, irrigation in autonomous manner, right? So how do, how do you kind uh, of uh, how do you uh, play in the arid regions where there is no rainfall so they are acute rain, there is a shortage of rainfall so how your company is going to deal with those areas or regions like arid regions so may I know okay so the point is about uh, managing the available water uh, i'll give you an example which will answer your question uh, uh, Tamil, i'm not sure if you know the uh, Tamil, uh, Tamil structure so there is a district down south, which uh, part of it is, uh, uh, you know, uh, has very, very good rainfall. And in fact, part of it is almost like a desert where uh, your water availability is uh, at about a uh, thousand feet or below. But again, uh, it really is not a good, uh, uh, you know, water that, can, that you can use for agriculture. So uh, there was a farmer who in fact uh, used all kinds of rain harvest mechanisms and he had a 25 acres of land of which only two acres he was able to cultivate now uh, because uh, there was no water so uh, he his intention was to save uh, every little drop that he could uh, so uh, when he adopted our technology what he is now able to do is with the same water he is able to cultivate eight acres so as against two acres that he was able to do then he is now able to cultivate eight acres of course he cannot cultivate the entire 25 acres because there is no water for that but from two to eight is a good uh, scale and that's so uh, i look at it so if there is a scenario where there is zero water uh, you know no irrigation no agriculture no growth run can work there but we can optimize the available water thank you sir yeah because actually i am being a, i'm in a process of starting my own agri startup where in the regions of there is no real 
low there is less of water so i it was the best platform that i connected with you so i would like uh, can you please give me some uh, cover information regarding your company so that i can connect with you yeah so i think towards the end of the program uh, our contact details are going to be shared with you we've already dropped in sir apologies for interrupting we've already dropped in all the mail ids in okay. the chat and we are going to send a mail to each and every participants with the video link as well as uh, your contact details and uh, and only one request to all the participants when they try to contact me uh, please do not whatsapp either sms or uh, email because i don't open whatsapp and also yeah, we are issuing yeah. the mail as of now we are not providing yeah. mobile number we are only giving mail id sir that's fantastic okay thank you yeah uh, any uh, any other question mr ravi kumar or we can move to the next participant yeah thank you sir you can move to the next participant Thank you, Mr. Ravi Kumar. Uh, uh, Shiva Kumar, sir, you have asked multiple questions. Uh, you would like to anything is left in the, your list of questions. You would uh, like to interact with our speakers today? Uh, no, sir. One of the questions, you know, whatever is, uh, you know, I, I have given the chat, and some of the questions are already been answered. I think. Okay, we'll move to the next one then. Thank you, Mr. Vivek Patel. Yes. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Yes, Hello? Vivek, please. Yes, yes yeah. sir. Am, am, I, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. You are audible. Please ask. Yeah. Hi. Actually, I'm a farmer from Hyderabad and I'm doing farming in 20 acres of land right now. So as part of this meeting, I just wanted to understand how this agri startup uh, environment is going on uh, in all over the world. So as part of many speakers spoke about their ideas and prospectus, like how we can move in this agri industry the question comes here like uh, is this particular agri startup able to pitch in for the small scale farmers uh, whereas uh, as a small example i would like to ask like even a particular chemical if a product is being showed and experimented on the fields to explain the farmers how it's working so that chemical might cost uh, around like 1000 rupees or 1500 but whereas when we have any small iot based setup to establish within a farm or a, a la, for an agriculture land. Uh, do you think a farmer would be very convinced to invest? Because I see literacy rate among farmers is very less, whereas the, when it comes to huge investments, the only huge investments that a farmer is readily able to do is in implements as well as tractor or any kind of mechanical uh, support that they'll that will be helpful for their farm. So do you people think that uh, will it really work out in coming years to convince a farmer to invest such amount to automization or towards uh, better management, farm management, or uh, post-harvest management, or whatever it may be? Okay. This is the one question I would like to ask. Any speaker could uh, just uh, pitch in uh, their ideas, like what do you think uh, about this? Sure, I will start with a simple answer. Uh, yeah. If, yeah. If, you look at, if you look at the history of drip irrigation, which started, yeah. I believe, uh, somewhere around 1975, uh, the governments were able to push it only through subsidies, and uh, not uh, not many farmers were willing to buy it on their own because they thought it was forced on them. Now, if you look at uh, 2000, uh, you know, uh, 15 onwards, uh, the trend has completely changed. Now. Uh, people are going to the drip irrigation dealers and the companies directly and saying, I don't want what is given as part of the subsidy because that doesn't meet my specification. Uh, I need this specification. Uh, so because the government norms are pretty standard and they don't fund, for example, if you wanted a pressure compensated drip irrigation system, uh, the, I, I'm not sure about all the states, but in Tamil Nadu, that is not recognized by the government's uh, schemes. So. There are farmers who go to the replication companies and say, I need this system. I know it, it is not covered by subsidy. I'm willing to pay and they pay for it. So it has taken around 35, 40 years for people to realize. And uh, it has been a very slow progression. And that is true with any uh, innovation in the world. Um, I remember when I bought my first uh, uh, automatic uh, gear uh, transmission car, uh, people said it doesn't suit for Indian roads. And uh, if you really think about it, why would anybody say it doesn't suit for Indian roads? But that's what people used to say. But today the trend is changing. Uh, people, uh, there are more uh, uh, automated transmission cars 
that get into the market, uh, especially the private cars, uh, than the or or equal, right? So it is going to take time. I am not going to be in a position to convince all the farmers to buy today, and neither will startups like us. Maybe there are about you know handful of uh, startups in India that are doing things similar to what we do. Neither. Uh, can we all together supply this and make all the farms IoT enabled uh, tomorrow? It is going to take time. So both uh, the mindset of the farmers will take time to change. Uh, for people like us to be able to really help the farmers adopt to the new technology to be relevant in the future also is going to take time. So it is a slow progress. Both farmers and the companies like us will go hand in hand. Uh, it will pick up. It is going to take in my in my uh, uh, own view. Uh, the technology, uh, technological adoption rate, uh, what took uh, 100 years, uh, then took 20 years, then you know takes 10 years, then takes two years. So my own personal view, it is going to be another uh, five years uh, for um, you know farmers to come forward and voluntarily start to adopt systems like this. Yeah, uh, the thank very you, well you, said. Uh, I agree with your uh, particular uh, answer. And just one more question I had for uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Sudanshu Gupta. I think he's there. Sudanshu had uh, some network issues, sir. Uh, okay. Give us a moment. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, no problem. I just I wanted to ask. We have given the ID. We can contact him directly, and uh, or else you can talk to us because he's. Uh, in our ecosystem only is also under our care of the system where we have 29 business incubators across India where we are funding up to 25 lakhs if they are already in a revenue generation and funding up to 5 lakhs there at idea stage. Uh, on that occasion, I would like to mention that the call for applications by Manage Center for Innovation uh, is open under their RK of the program. We have shared the link there in the our chat box, you can check that anybody would like to apply for RK of the program, they're welcome. Where they'll get an opportunity to get trained uh, followed by a funding opportunity. And then I'll I'll move to the next uh, speaker. Sorry, sorry, next question. Mr. Satyapal. He was there just now. I think he left. We'll go to the Vijay Singh Rajput. Vijay, sir, can you hear us? Yes, sir. Uh, am I audible? You are audible now, sir. Please. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, being an electronic engineer and agribusiness professional, sir, I am uh, feeling this uh, session very useful for me. And uh, I would really like to work, sir, in such ecosystem. Uh, and currently, I am working on Win World Bank project, sir, with government of Maharashtra, that is smart project. So I like to know the opportunities and uh, where I can be part of such network and ecosystem because there are many limited uh, opportunities for uh, young angry angry entrepreneurs like me and I don't find any proper platform to be engaged with such ecosystem. So I like with from all the panelists, I would like uh, uh, your guidance on this. Sir. Uh, I didn't quite understand the question. Uh... Is it is it about sir? I want to. Yes, sir, uh, related for career opportunities, sir, and uh, sir, there are many limited uh, like agri startups and firms which are working in this ecosystem. Uh, so I am an electronic engineer, sir, and I am from last uh, five years I'm working in agri business profession. So, so which are such a platform or such a companies where I can uh, means communicate or be part of this network and uh, which, what type of opportunities are there in future, sir? For this, I mean, just want to explore, sir. Okay, so what I suggest is if you, uh, I think Mr. Daniel has shared his presentation and if you go through his presentation, uh, he has done a fantastic job of listing all the agri space companies, technology enabled companies in different spaces. So as an electronic engineer, uh, my suggestion to you would be to take a look at the list that Mr. Daniel has shared and see uh, what interests you or which line of uh, business and related companies will attract uh, your, uh, uh, attract you. And maybe you should try to get connected with them uh, and see what the opportunities are. Yeah, so uh, let me answer that also slightly differently. So eight years back, there was a you know a young chap who came to me and asked, "What should I study?" So I said, "You know, I am, we are all we are all in computer science and IT, 
I said, like, you know, solar is an opportunity, right? But uh, so he did his bachelor's, then he did his master's from BIT, Vellore in, uh, you know, uh, energy systems. And after that, uh, you know, he struggled to get a solar job, you know, but whereas the IT jobs were plenty. So, but now uh, the solar jobs are rushing after him. So you see that solar ecosystem in the last uh, eight to 10 years kind of like matured worldwide. And now you, you see for climate change related issues, solar is the one of the best options given. So looking at it, your the jobs that are available in the ag tech sector may be low right now because of this uh, 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 low number of uh, companies hiring as well as, you know, the everybody is just getting into this space right now. Uh, everybody is lo closely watching what what are the successful models that have been created, uh, and uh, uh, you know, if the when I'm pretty sure the market will boom, so you should be able to ride that wave. Uh, you know, these are the, these are coming waves. Tomorrow, I don't think in the next five years anybody is going to say there is no more agri tech. Agri tech is over. That sentence is not going to come. Okay, so I can say for sure. Because uh, you know, seeing the patterns of the other industries, or uh, for the last uh, twenty plus years, uh, you get to see that. Of course, uh, ag tech is not mature. Not many are getting real value, but this is it's happening. That's uh, as far as I say. If you look at it, uh, IBM's IBM's one of the clo core items that they do right now is blockchain systems, and they are partnered with a large, uh, uh, one of the largest. Uh, uh, call, uh, what do you call uh, companies in the world called Walmart for sourcing their grocery, so uh, with, with traceability, right? So uh, if you look at it, after Walmart, who it's it, it is Reliance. Reliance is starting using their you know they are putting a lot of tech inside their uh, 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 procurement. Then you have the Tatas, so. You know, this is a field that is just growing. So, you know, you, if, if you're really interested and uh, you have the motivation to stay, even though sometimes the salaries may be low at some places, but as it matures, you know, the, your salary as well as your opportunities keep, will keep growing. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll, we'll take one or two more questions before we conclude. Uh, we'll move to the next one. Mr. Golan Naulak. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Am I audible? All good Golan. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this uh, is a general question and uh, uh, any one of the panelists, uh, I would request them to answer. Uh, I am joining in uh, for this uh, meeting from Manipur, and I'm a part of a network uh, called the Northeast uh, Hill Agro Entrepreneurs Network. And we've been trying uh, with a lot of uh, ad tech uh, development happening, happening in, especially in South India. We, uh, we, what we realized was that most of uh, these ad tech companies first may be not interested in hill farming, uh, but if there would be any uh, ad, ad tech solutions uh, you know, to promote hill agriculture, hill hill farming, we would love to connect with those and and see uh, maybe with the state government's help or with like NABARD or KVKs, if we can work out like a pilot or a demonstration, uh, we'd be very excited and take this across the entire Indian Himalayan region, right from Ladakh uh, till you know Arunachal in the east. So we have the network. We just need the right kind of uh, support, uh, hand holding, because uh, we've tried this with NASCOM uh, our, uh, last year. Uh, but nothing really materialized. So if the panelists can really help us connect, um, it would be really helpful for us. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Golan, uh, I think I, I personally have tried uh, uh, the hill stations and uh, we have, after, after several years of attempt, uh, we have just started working in the Kerala hillside in one particular district called uh, Iriki. And uh, we, are, we are yet to break the ice with the officials in uh, uh, Uti. The, that's the other uh, uh, hilly region um, in Tamil Nadu. So it is not that we uh, uh, these companies are shying away from hilly region, but the but the only problem is most of the hilly region uh, people 
are uh, very familiar with uh, flood irrigation and sometimes they don't have any water shortage therefore they think there is no intervention required but uh, where we get an opportunity we'll be more than glad to work together so therefore i will be personally interested in getting connected and uh, working uh, uh, on on any possibility great thank you sir i'll we'll write to you we have your email id now uh, we'll, we'll we'll be writing to you soon sure thank you thank you all uh, so uh, sorry for uh, uh, breaking now uh, we we'll, would we'll be uh, we have shared all the details and we'll be sharing again through a mail id you can interact with our uh, panelists today i would like uh, heartfully thank all our three speakers today uh, benjamin sir uh, uh, mr thomas as well as uh, sudam shu thank you very much for sharing your uh, journey experiences and uh, insights for all, for all our uh, attendees today thank you thank you very much i would like to thank our entire managed team uh, especially jinath and kaushik being here despite holiday thank you thank you very much for your time would like to uh, and on this occasion would like to mention that we have just completed our 52nd webinar just completed one year one year of our journey with close to 28000 registered participants thank you thank you very much everybody have a great day uh, have a happy weekend thank you we'll see you